Ladies and gents, I'm Rusi Jibreaksan and this is the history of paper money, bare bones economy, extra issue part 3 by the channel extra credits, poor England, first Charles I and civil war then losing to the French, then the great fire of London, luckily Nicholas Barbon came along to help and make obscene amount of money, who says you can't do both, okay, so Nicholas Barbon is a pretty important figure apparently, especially after the city burned down and lost with the French, huh. Yeah, this is going to be a fun video. Uh, you know, so far it's been awesome how the, you know, money and paper money concept came. Uh, when the economy grows, something like that had to be invented. So it was inevitable in a way, right? Because gold, you cannot just carry on gold and valuables like that. So this was inevitable. I mean, you know, banks give out this IOUs and people use that as money because it's powered by bank. You trust the bank. So simply, you know, a paper money has power because some powerful entity says it's a power. And that's it. So if people recognize the entity that, okay, I recognize this as a, you know, trustworthy and powerful entity. Then, you know, in the eyes of those people, those paper has value. So that's the money, I guess. There are six part of this. Damn. So there's going to be way too much detail about this. All right. Remember, if you like my reaction, if you like, subscribe, check out the Rick Sunday, there's a link in the description. Check out the Castle playlist like history with all of my historical videos. Uh, Internet historian, CGP Gray, Oli Sarkastic Production, uh, and yeah, Tier Zoo, and let's watch this one. In the last episode, we got to the ad hoc, unofficial beginnings of paper money. This week, we look at some of the rogues gallery that really created the intellectual argument for adopting paper money in some more official way. When we last left off in England in 1640, the first unofficial banknotes were starting to circulate. But in the early 1660s in Stockholm, the first semi-official banknotes, the first banknotes from what we might think of as a central bank, the first banknotes that really started to replace a hard currency, began to appear. But with those banknotes come the problem of unregulated fractional reserve banking. Remember how we mentioned that the goldsmiths of London yeah. realized that using banknotes they could actually lend out more money than they had gold or silver to cover? Well, in Stockholm, they really went to town. Soon, there were so many banknotes out there that people couldn't help but notice. And as soon as people noticed, every <laughs> so, That bank just realized, wait a minute, people trust us, and nobody's gonna turn in this IOUs, basically, to claim their gold or whatever. So let's just give out more money, just like they did in the, you know, in the England. And they're like, okay, a bit more wouldn't hurt. All right, we've given out this much. What's a bit more than that? And just gave away, gave away. Then they realized, oh shit, we gave away 10 times that, than the gold we have right now. 10 times I owe. What if everybody cares back now? Which is they're going to do? Everybody rushed to the bank to get their banknotes turned back into coins, which of course they couldn't do. And there goes the Swedish economy. So clearly there were still some kinks to work out with these newfangled banknotes. Now let's hop back to England, one civil war and half a dozen other wars after Charles I so politely jump-started this whole banking thing with that forced loan of his. The year is 1695. The English have just gotten themselves kicked around in the channel by the French. And if we know anything about history, we know that that will never do. Yeah. So the English <laughs> establish a central bank, the Bank of England, to raise money and to help the government pay to refit the navy. As part of this, they issued banknotes. But the idea of banknotes and their role in the economy had been a topic of debate in England for a few years. Which leads us to the first of our roguish economic theorists, and yes, this is his real name, Nicholas, if Jesus Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned barebone. Who, for obvious reasons, went by the name This is his real name? No way, man! How can you middle name like that? If Jesus Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned. Really? <laughs> Nicholas, Damn. Barbon. Yeah. Nicholas Barbon's father was, praise God, barebone. Yes, really. Who will surely make an appearance in episodes covering the English Civil War? Nick Barbon started his career as a doctor, getting his degree from the University of Utrecht and joining the Royal College of Physicians. But this trade had too much saving people and too little amassing vast quantities of wealth. So yeah. Nicholas turned instead to real estate and construction. Luckily, he hit a brick. <laughs> So he's like, okay, this is all noble and shit. I'm saving people, but I could give a fuck about that. I want money, man. Where's my goal? So he just look at that. Oh, yeah, I could exploit that. <laughs> like when in 1666, the Great Fire of London swept through and incinerated about 13,000 homes. And Ooh, 
in 1666 so triple six in the end at that time uh, you know the half of the, you know lots of london and parts of that burned up london being christian city they would have seen that all oh, look at that it happened in 666 left about a sixth of the city homeless huzzah this of course was seen as a great opportunity by barbon who would rebuild most of london and even very illegally reshape it if you've ever been to the western parts of the Strand or Bloomsbury, those areas basically exist because Barbon didn't listen to any of the restrictions that said that you couldn't build between London and Westminster. After all, as he saw it, that's where the open land was, where easier to build. I mean, yeah, it's open because it's illegal to build there, but what? Hold up there, what? So, London and Westminster, where's Westminster? Yeah, okay, so you can't build that, is that it? Damn, there was a law you can't build that. And this is the guy that's, you know, that broke the law and built shit there. That is there, obviously, right now. So there was a law for a long time that this place has to be empty or something. And this guy just saw it like, fuck that, I'm going to build it. Is that it? Damn, that's something. Those are build easier to build. I mean, yeah, it's open because it's illegal to build there, but what are they going to do? Tear down the houses he just built? They're already built. Deal with it. And from there, mean, the sky was the limit. Barbon first got into the reputable business of selling fire insurance in a town that had just burnt down. After that, he realized that he could invent the mortgage. I mean, I can't say that he was absolutely, absolutely the first person to really invent the modern mortgage, but he certainly was the first major player to do so in England. Damn. He created the National Land Bank and began to- Invented mortgage? That's big. Issue loans secured by people's homes or property. He followed that up with a few stints in Parliament, largely to avoid prosecution. There then you he go. Retired to there you go. There's, like I said, hmm, okay. Once you build the structures, you can't tear it down, but you could put him in jail. But obviously, he went to Parliament and, you know, get a seat there to make sure he doesn't get prosecuted. Write some books. And it's really the books that we are interested in, and the thoughts he put in them. Because while I have been joking about his wild and rapacious greed, he was highly intelligent. And yeah, it's kind of hard to write him off as evil. All of these things he did actually ended up having positive effects, and his writing sort of shows that he knew that. Ensuring people against fire... Look, mortgage and all these things, people, lots of people see it as evil because bank basically bleeds people down with uh, interest. But if you know what you're doing, that could be really helpful, right? Only if you're gullible and get yourself, I don't know, get exploited in a way. I mean, you can't blame the person for that, right? But if you, if you know what you're doing, if you know what you're getting into, it could be really helpful. So mortgage and things like that that he invented is really helpful for lots of people. It provided him with a guaranteed profit, but also created a great deal more stability for the English economy. Fires were still a major issue, but no longer would they be a massive economic displacement. Instead, everybody would put some money into the pot to bail out whoever lost their home or trade to a fire, and he would skim a little from the top. Great for the economy. And mortgages? While we might today think of them as the bank's way of keeping us down, so much of England's wealth was locked up in real estate that it was a huge drag to the national economy. When people bought a house, that money just stayed locked up in that house. It didn't circulate through the economy, it didn't help to finance businesses, it just sat there until somebody generations later decided to sell it. But with the idea of the mortgage, the single biggest asset that most people owned was now freed up to help drive the economy. Instead of the seller simply getting a pile of cash and the buyer getting an unspendable house, the mortgage freed up that value. You could now spend your house and live in it too, meaning that that money could circulate through the economy again and again. And Barbin was also, of course, one of the first people to decouple morality and spending. Which totally sounds evil, I admit, but up until this point, a lot of the writing on money was written by the church, basically arguing that everybody lived the simplest life possible. And that's probably good advice in a lot of ways, but it doesn't make for a dynamic economy. Barbin argued for fashion and innovation, because they get people to buy new goods before they've fully consumed the previous goods, thereby creating demand. And while we're not to Adam Smith yet, the basic concept that demand creates supply and grows the economy is there in Barbin's work. But for us, his most important... The guy was ultimate capitalist, right? Damn. I mean, you know, I don't... I, I can see people seeing him, he, seeing him as evil. Mortgages and things like that and spending too much as evil. But that does drive the economy. That does make countries richer. And if you're smart enough, that could help you, not ruin you. 
and you know overall that helps global economy basically people get richer countries get richer countries invest in things invent things and here we are today so you know uh, economy thriving is really important he just make it more easier important work is probably his arguments against mercantilism Mercantilism was the driving political and economic theory in most of Europe in Barbon's day. Basically, it sort of saw nations as being in a state of perpetual economic war. The goal for any nation was to get as much literal gold and silver as it could for itself, and try not to give any to anybody else. In a broader sense, the object was to have your state be self-sustaining, importing as little as possible while exporting as much as you could. Colonies existed to feed the mother country, and weren't allowed to trade with any country other than their colonial power. And when imports had to be made, the goal was to only import raw materials, so that they could be turned into more valuable finished goods in your country. And while today we see a lot of reasons why every country trying to produce every type of good is a terrible idea, in some ways mercantilism makes a lot more sense when you think of economies based on commodity money, like gold or silver. After all, if your entire economy is based on gold and silver, then your economy can literally only be as big as the amount of gold and silver you have. While many were starting to see this dilemma, Barbon cut to the heart of it. He basically said that even gold and silver don't have innate value. They are just worth whatever the market values them at. So instead of so stockpiling more gold and silver to grow your economy... It's a shiny rock. People see it as value, that's why it's a money, basically. Why don't you just get rid of gold and silver entirely, and move to paper money? But these ideas of Barbon's are only the beginning of the intellectual groundwork that will see a world accept slips of paper in exchange for a loaf of bread, a cell phone, or a house. Join us next time and we will witness somebody else try to put their own theories on paper money into practice, on the grandest scale. Okay, what's his name? Nicholas, if Jesus Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned bare bone. The guy was a genius, right? I mean, obviously, it, it, the people were already experimenting with that, with the IOUs and things banks were doing. But this guy just point blank thought that, you know what, why not just adapt this? This gold and silver has value because we say it has value. Otherwise, it's just shiny rocks, who cares? So, you know, the, he's like, okay, let's adapt paper money rather than doing all this shit. I mean, he's really the guy who literally just, you know, put front the idea like we should point blank adapt this paper money. And the guy invented mortgages and things. It basically helped the economy grow that something. Damn, he also created, you know, fire insurance and things like that. So it, it doesn't become uh, any kind of fire doesn't become way too much burden on the country, on the government or whatever. The guy was really important. I've never heard of that. But yeah, the guy is really important. All right, people, that was the history of paper money, bare bones. I don't know why he said bar bones or whatever his name is. What, what's wrong with bare bones? I guess sounds ominous, bare bones or something. I don't know. If you like my next one, don't forget to like, subscribe, check out the links and there's a link in the description, check out the cards, check out the cards, and I'll see you next time.